three quarters. <laughs> In other words, 75. Ah. Quatros. Yes. Another thing, you know, when I went camping outdoors, I always looked for a bed. And all I found were beds of flowers, <laughs> rocky beds, beds of leaves. Never give her a full size <laughs> or a queen. Yeah. Well, I wasn't in the Castro. <laughs> Yeah, today on the cover of the examiner was a photograph of two people I had met more than 35 years ago, of course. Moscone and Miller. I met Moscone at the night that the peanut president <laughs> got in. And I was downtown on Market Street, and I, I was, I managed to get into the high mucky muck political San Francisco political party. And I met Miss Gomi. Well, I met Harvey Milk on Market Street. And I said, I, I had a search flag company, a huge search flag company. And I said, I will give you a searchlight the next time you run. And he turned to me and said, there won't be a next time. Mm -hmm. Really? And there wasn't. And the reason that I would have done it for him was that both of them looked forward, not backward. That both of them looked at all of us. Not just gays, not just blacks, not just Chinese, but all of us. And when you think about it, we didn't have much choice. I didn't have much choice about being a male, or white, or a Finn, like I am. But I'm only half Finn. I've got another whole Finn to go. <laughs> You're looking good for 75, brother. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to Owen, then John, and Chris, and Aaron, and Charles, and Baruch. Show itself in the coal or from the library stacks. 
where you, you expected to find a home. They, the metaphors, that is, are never on, on the bus, nor are they really in the air, for they sometimes blow by like leaves in the wind. Poems. Raven noises defile the air, it scares the pigeons. Two, bleak thoughts, bleak thoughts. My mind cries for a sentence, my mind, my mind. My mind becomes the wind for a split second, then becomes the air, the quiet vanishes. Three, at the trias, I'm writing right here. Four, the wind, the puke and throb. The wind of puke and throb, the puke of air, I do easily scare. My wits are elsewhere. The fallen shoe, a poem in prose. A cup of curves captivates the soul of the ballet of balls and balustrades. Capture the sound of shoes as they mutter or squeak with impossible aloofness. Shoes are the men on the street to the damnified boots. The impression they give of the self-made chemise of the American aristocrat. Out to show the world, the world of ordinary shoes. What the streetwise poseur is all about. They lift the not worn out right wear to braggadocio and yes, profundity. I feel sorry for this poem. I wander as Ishmael, wander through the lonely day, try as I may to be. My knowledge sits on a mountain, high above the furry men's and waves. Nothing alone, nothing. I'm the opposite of alone. I wander like a bone to be fed to a dog. A cur does not purr like a cat. I am trapped like a rat in a cage. I feel no rage. I am as stationary as a sage. This is one page of poetry that is an attempt at metaphor without logic. I feel sorry for it, for it is pedagogic. <laughs> I am the poet I dream about. The morning of the fate of the stars. I feel stripped of the cares and the stares of the many. People walk by, I sigh for their wishes. That is, I, I think they wish and are glad they are here, and nothing more than the air. My thoughts are one with the sun. And they try to reach the evasive moon that hides from the day and coldly wishes us good night. I'm stuck with myself, alone and with no one else, nobody else. Is the poet a dreamer? I dream, and I know how many sides a one-dimensional brown triangle has. At the beach, the dark traces of the shadows of seagulls' wings, those ruffled or cocoa titans, the waves, salute the empty tide pools, shiny as shine mirrors. <laughs> Café Trieste. To be as Triestano, that is a conozente, you are solemn, tough, happy, botanic, profound, and are enjoying every second of your peculiar, peculiar sovereignty. You have invented your own state of things. You're a sports fan and are conventional, that is, I see you, I see you as conventional, insofar as you are normal, and how the normal see you cry at funerals and rejoice at weddings. You are happy in your normalcy as it stands, stands to reality and the glories of your imagination. August day after Robert Lowe. Okay. Apart from it all, I sit with a quiet corner. I see things with my eyes. A few suited passers-by. This is the dress, this is the dress cafe. The title of this poem comes from sacred music, a prayer. Agnes Day means Lamb of God. I search for a metaphor. The whole cafe is a poem I could not write. The tables are filled with people. There are no metaphors around, nothing. Gransky is quiet and that is that. There is emphasis on emptiness. Without, without a poem, I heard myself, uh, I myself, am I limited or are they? 
Who's confused for which passion is it? Mine or theirs? Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you all. <laughs> all right. Uh, Don and Chris and Karen and Charles and Baruch and myself. The Lord Ha Ha. History lesson is there. I'll have to get back to it. I have an announcement from the Burroughs Hill Flyers out. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Is this thing working? Yeah. Because my voice is. Uh, my announcement is that there's a, a new monthly poetry reading starting in San Francisco. Poetry at Promenade begins Saturday, December 7th, the day of infamy, 7 to 9.30 p.m. at the La Promenade Cafe, which used to be the Zephyr Cafe, which is on Balboa Street, at 38th Avenue across the street from the Balboa Theater. And the hosts are myself and Bill Mercer. And the first feature reader was suppo is supposed to be Dan Brady, but he might be out with foot surgery. Yeah, we'll see. If that happens, we're hoping that doesn't. Then we'll uh, we'll hunt. Or happens eventually, but not then. Not okay. then. But we're, we plan to do it every month, first Saturday of every month, and uh, the uh, cafe owner is pretty enthusiastic about it. So with uh, with his support, we think we'll be able to pull it off. Thank you. Okay, now to your poems. <coughs> yeah. Commercial announcement is over. Oh, and it's in uh, honor of the 50th, I believe, yeah, 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I'm going to read the only JFK poem I've ever written, which is a little bit rough, rough, relevant to it. It's called Michelangelo. Got a ride to New York for half the gas. Met a friend working at a restaurant in Cape Cod, got me a job. Bussing tables for a few dollars and leftovers, prime rib and pasta right off the plate. The money I didn't spend on food would go a long way in Spain. We had one-way tickets on the Michelangelo, third class, out of the mouth of the Hudson onto the open sea to Cannes in 1963. <coughs> The fall of the year that Kennedy should have stayed out of Dallas. JFK should have said, screw this job, taking a ship with us to France instead. My friend always says, half laughing, half crying, Jesus, we were there on the Cape. Why didn't we drop by? Say hello, play a little touch football, persuade the boy to come with us for a ride on the Michael Angel. Um. Cafe, it's uh, 38th and Balboa. You know, the Balboa Theater is directly yeah. across the street from the Balboa. Okay, this is a poem that uh, I wrote about uh, Jack Kerouac. It's called Bum Dharma. <laughs> Kerouac must have learned shuffling <coughs> midtown sidewalks, straggling around the country with red wine friends getting lost after football injuries in the saxophone sounds of Harlem, tripping himself up on Lower East Side trash cans, puking, dreaming of leaving town to be somebody, wondering if the torrent of words that fevered his sober brain and kept him drinking were worth a damn, or could even be written. He might have learned from people of the streets keeping secrets in the broken veins of their noses about ecstatic, ethereal possibilities, leaning against dirty bricks, slick with hope's drainage, seeing, <coughs> being, repeating, being, and seeing like a dharma drone in some alley under weak lights before the world turned on his soap opera life, bummed out his dharma, punched out his karma, sent him on his gone road thumbing, running up on transcendental bums in LA train yards, stopping 
dropping wisdom bits, dry as spittle, caught in tangled beards, howling among midnight train whistles, trying to make Frisco in time for the Renaissance. On his long day's journey into being, Mr. Midnight, Mr. Mystical Gringo getting high on Mexico, high on Yankee words, positively beatific on tequila, sweating out a Tangier romance with an ignored junkie buddy drowning in Arab boys in the soft bare limbs of children, suffocating in their eyes, in their silence. The dear Dharma bum become intimate with Zen, like some kind of Christ with dread in his head, like some kind of Kierkegaard with Willie Nelson in his head, trying to find his way home, the chant with Alan and the myth of Moriarty, surrounded by red wine friends and unimagined crowds poised on ugly edges of themselves, looking for some of the bummed out Dharma they could call their own in search of comforting madness all their own, sometimes being, sometimes seeing, sometimes just needing a repetitious performance so precisely amazing, so precarious and delicately unbalanced that a drunken man needing a shave and a second shopping cart might seduce the Dharma into giving up nirvana if he could find a voice for the right word, locate the right vein, or throw his body from a precise and perfect edge of the alcoholic yoga into Jack's divine abyss. Oh, out there for us. All right. Uh, Chris, then Karen, then Charles Baruch, Mark O'Harps, who just walked in, <coughs> Lord Ha Ha, and Minnie Ha Ha, who so, uh, do their famous duets. Okay, here's the couple poems. This is called Three Knocks. When I was a kid, I was always at a loss. The others all seemed to know something, which I didn't. So they laughed at me. I didn't really care. I stared at the classroom door. One day I heard three knocks, loud. No one else heard them. But because I didn't know anything, I never asked about it. It would always seem I was at a disadvantage. When I was 16, I went to a party, feeling awful. The others were making out. I didn't even know what a girl was, <laughs> let alone how to kiss her. Then someone gave me a swallow of Jack Dan. I think it was. Then I asked for another and another. Suddenly I started talking, talking to girls. I felt brave, I felt normal. That night I got my first kiss and I heard it. Three knocks coming from somewhere. For years I drank and oh, the women I had. They loved me and I loved them back. But the three knocks never returned. One wet day, I quit drinking, and I forgot everything I knew. The girls didn't matter, but I forgot how to write, and I lost my soul, and something strange took its place. I became successful. I owned property, got married, had children, grew old, was loved by many. Last night I was playing with my kitten. She has the pale blue eyes of death. And I heard it, the three knocks, loud and coming from somewhere. Coleridge heard them at the door when he was writing his great poem, Xanadu. And fools knock three times on wood. It's supposed to be the wood of the true cross. And of course, the cock crew three times when Peter denied our Lord. I have no idea what it means, but now when I'm old and the other old ones seem to know something, I do not. But yet, they keep dying and I do not. And I am waiting for those final three knocks, hammer blows on the door or three kisses before the death of love, or deep scratches by my kitten 
with the pale blue eyes of death. It is a mystery, and poetry is a mystery. Three tears falling from the eyes of the muse. Three perfect words which we can never write. Three wise men bearing gifts of hopelessness. Three knocks on the door, loud and demanding. We are lonely, and it is dark in here. Let us in. Save me. Save me from myself. Bottle the lips, foam at the soul. Save me from the pounding of the walls, my shoes climbing up my throat. Save me from love, who is the killer and the savior, and what we have instead of God. Save me and hold me tight against the monsters who save me against the people every time. Save me as I am not worth saving. Nothing is worth saving but saving itself. There are black boots and eyes with swastika pupils. Strange men who run this land, and this strange land poisoned daily by our heroes covered in blood and hope. Save me because I want to live when dying would be more profound and create much better poetry. <laughs> save me from poetry and save me from art and how I want to be normal, but it is not possible. I am one of the weird eyes cursed with sight, lips broken like dolls, faces cursed with beauty when only ugliness is truth. Save me from life because death saves the world. The curse that cures, the murder that heals, the lie that speaks the truth. Save me, because what doesn't kill me makes me weaker. And to be weaker is to know, and knowledge is salvation. Save me, because love needs me. I am stronger than the world, and I must live to take care of my few innocent souls. And then my guilt can damn me to hell. And I will not care. I was born broken. I will die the same. And only the broken know the truth. And only the truth can save us all. Everybody's been very brave and out there, so I think maybe I'll hide behind my pronoun now. Let me know what you think. Um, this is going to be on kind of current events, um, issues that are prescient today. And I'm going to start with The Dragon That Can, uh, written October 8, 2013. You may recall that uh, the NSA system in Utah was in. The NSA system in Utah is down like a dragon in a cave, choking on its own fire. Health care in America excludes its poorest citizens, the cooks, cleaners, and nurses' aides, the children in the deep south, are too poor to qualify. Their states can deny them doctors, hospitals, medicine, because our nation's lawmakers says they can. Our government refuses to help the poorest states with the poorest people. California has that power to influence movement towards a federal mandate that all be covered regardless of the impoverishment of the states where they live. Let us be the dragon that could. Let California become the magic dragon that demands justice. Let San Francisco become the dragon that demands that our state demand of our nation the right to health care for all who live in this great country. Let the NSA dragon choke on its own fire while the money spent feeding it be spent to save the lives of the poorest of the poor. Yeah. Thank you. I'm writing a series of poetry for the Board of Supervisors. And here's another one. This is uh, concerned with the artificial turf that they want to, you know, put everywhere. Yeah. Plastic aromas instead of grass. Polycarbonates and biophenyl A. 
proven to interrupt endocrine cycles, proven to affect fertility, proven to lead to lower intelligence in developing brains, like those of children, now ever more popular on sports fields and soon Golden Gate Park. San Francisco's oasis of green, its sacred natural sanctuary, soon to be home to polluting esters from fake grass to be played upon, rolled upon, wrestled upon by children playing soccer or other sports to gradually disintegrate as plastics do. And in that disintegration, produce more pollutants to invade growing brains, to invade growing bodies, produce more pollutants from plastics made from fossil fuels. Plastics that are not biodegradable. Plastics that disintegrate into bits of plastic to be eaten by animals and birds and find their way through the food chain to us and our children, polluting the bodies of animals and birds and humans. Artificial turf is no proxy for living, growing green, is no proxy for life. with uh, the Inuit and also with pollution but on a more global scale. The Inuit, close to nature, close to the heart of Mother Earth, enduring millennia upon millennia of nature's harsh lessons of tough love, born of conditions the Earth has created, simply existing, evolving, revolving and spinning through seasons balanced upon a revolving globe as part of its pattern, essential to its character, non-essential to its existence, drinking once fresh, unadulterated waters, consuming fresh game and fish and vegetation, breathing untainted air from healthy lungs of earth, enjoying unsullied paradise on a singing planet, taught and raised in a challenging garden of beginnings, finding nourishment from rich, clean soils, from pristine streams and oceans, finding refuge in caves, or sheltering under detritus of leaves and trees, building families, communities, societies to live with the earth in harmony, in the Arctic hemisphere, in harmony with the earth, in harmony, pollution blows north, Pollution from non-Inuit peoples who exploit the earth, who will not learn to sing and dance with earth as partner, who will not learn to breathe the lungs of earth's sweet, vibrant membranes with pure, untainted breath. Pollution blows north. Pollution blows north to the Inuit, blows north from China, blows north from the Americas, blows north with toxins blows north to poison once thriving fishing villages, blows north to suffocate the living tundra, blows north with asthma and cancer, blows north to rot the Inuit with wings of death against its creator. <laughs> Water is life. Water is sustenance. When water goes bad, when people in Texas, Pennsylvania, and Wyoming complain that their drinking water bubbles, that their drinking water smells, that their drinking water can be lit with a match when it is tested and proven to contain methane and arsenic, the EPA requests that oil and gas companies, fracking companies, investigate themselves as they continue polluting the water, continue fracturing for oil, continue digging for treasure, continue failing to treasure water, continue failing to treasure life as they investigate their own corrupt practices that they may continue polluting, continue contaminating water with impunity. <laughs>
Charles, then Baruch, then Marco Harps, then myself, then Garrett. Then our future should the person came to be here at the right proper time. They're on their way, but they're not here yet. Well, uh, Marissa Thompson. Oh, good. I'm prepared to do a feature. And the emergency, I can do it. And I, if the emergency so uh, desired, and she doesn't show up. You don't mind me playing you a song? Oh, come on, man. Uh, play it up, Charles. I don't mind you playing me a song. Instead of uh, <laughs> spoken word. What are you going to say, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Wow. I have uh, one very short JFK story. <laughs> what if George Herbert Walker Bush had gotten shot that day? Ooh, in David Classic. No one would have noticed. Oh. Well, oh. it would be a far different world. And the CIA wouldn't have bungled the investigation. Person mm -hmm. can't remember where he was that day, yeah. even though there were pictures of him there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, those were just beautiful topical poems that I'm not going to do my usual topical stuff so that yours can be framed. And I'm going to do the uh, story about a picture I found when I was walking down the street. One day I found this lady's picture just blowing through the alley. And she was like from the 1930s or 40s. And since she was married and probably long dead I, and otherwise unattainable, I felt instantly in love. And I wrote her this song. Against the trash, stepped on, walked on, torn by bits of broken glass. Barely turned a page, brain just cuts. I messed it up. Save me a red page. Sorry. Okay. Tell a photograph, I wonder. What priest come around? Cost you to cross my path. Almost in a puddle, and starkly against the trash. Stepped on, walked on, torn by bits of broken glass. Sapia with it, haze caused the edge to curl. I still see a smile on the photo of the girl. Has she gone out of where all the breezes hold their sway? Is that what makes it all so easily tossed away?
back then. But girl, what can I do? Said, but girl, what can I do about that? You're out there tossing in life's breezes. And I'm out here tossing in the same old breezes. Fisk guy, 
So Snowden's a hero. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Baruga. Come on up. Give him a nice round of applause. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Baruch Barnes Hernandez, and um, this is the piece I'm working on right now. Last April, I left my job of nine years working for a nonprofit arts organization. I left it to fully pursue my career as an actor slash writer slash performer. And then I remembered that I have absolutely no money. <laughs> because for the last nine years I've been working with a nonprofit arts. Yeah. And I am a very poor queer immigrant. Uh, so, because Facebook and Twitter and Google and everyone else across the board wouldn't hire me, I ended up working at one of the oldest coffee shops in San Francisco. But, in San Francisco, in the neighborhood, even though the coffee shop is in the neighborhood where I live, they only pay $11 an hour. Not enough to pay the bills or rent, especially in the city, even if I work more than 40 hours a week. So at night, I work at a sex club. Also a San Francisco institution. The oldest sex club for gay men in San Francisco. So in the mornings, I, uh, starting at 5 a.m., I shake cream vigorously to pour it into steaming hops of co hot cups of coffee to give caffeine to the techie douchebags that have gentrified the neighborhood. And then by night, I work the front door, the coat check, while I listen to men vigorously masturbating, off in the darkness in the depths of the club. My friend asks why I work at a sex club. You went to college. What? You, you know, you, you're in your 30s. I don't understand. You're so talented. Why are you working at a sex club? I said, oh, are you going to hire me? Yeah. Are you going to hire me at your really nice job that pays you $90,000 a year? No, don't ask me why I work at a sex club. Because San Francisco is fucking expensive. They should change the song. If you're going to San Francisco, don't put flowers in your hair. Those are expensive. You need to save your money for rent. Oh my lord. Somebody give me a better job. So he asked me if my parents know if I work at a sex club. I say, no. My parents are Mexican Catholic immigrants. They do not know I work at a sex club. They think I work at a nightclub, and that is all they need to know. Well, I'm sure your parents are like understand that, you know, you're not like a first generation immigrant. You're like a fresh, you just basically got here. So they, they must understand that you have to do things to survive. What do they do? I was like, well, my mother takes care of um, old ladies. She teaches Spanish on the side, but she helps um, old ladies near the end of their life. She's really good at it. She's really kind. She's wonderful. And she knows how to deal with death. He uh, asks me if he was like, well, that's, that's good then, you know, that you don't have to deal with death. And I started thinking, and I started asking questions at the sex club, uh, because a lot of our regulars are older gentlemen. So I asked my friend Ron, who is my favorite at the sex club, has anybody ever died here? He goes, girl, I think all of them are eventually going to die here. Um, who hasn't died here? Please, look at our regulars. They're like a death's door. So he tells me a story that um, Rich, the owner, was once eating cereal and did a spit take because he was reading an obituary that at the end of the obituary, first of all, he was sad that it was an obituary for one of our regulars. And he was like, oh, I'm so sad that our regular, one of our regulars is dead. But at the end of the obituary, it said, his, ash, his friends will spread his ashes at his favorite place, the sex club that he has been going to for the last 30 years. So he has an emergency meeting. The whole staff is there. We will not let these people spread their ashes in the sex club. <laughs> Ashes are toxic! I've already contacted his family. They said they don't know what, what I'm talking about. They didn't even know he was gay. So I tried finding his friends. His friends said, it's going to happen. I said, I'm not letting you into the sex club. You can't spread ashes here. It, you just can't. 
So I get an email saying it's going to happen, deal with it. So he hires an extra person and he tells the whole staff to be vigilant, to watch and watch and watch. We're supposed to watch anyway to make sure that people are doing sex, uh, having safe sex. Um, but to make sure that no one in the corner starts to like spread ashes. He's like, don't they know we clean this place every night? I mean, every morning? Don't they know how hard we clean? So I ask my, my friend Ron, who works there, I'm like, so what happened? He goes, well, he got mad because a month later, two other regulars died. And in their obituaries, they said they were spreading their ashes in the sex club. So he hired another guy. And for a year, with little flashlights, we were making sure no one was spreading ashes in the sex club. Well, so that means you didn't find any? Well, girl, I was hanging up. I was changing some light bulbs. The whole place was lit. It was during the day after I was done cleaning. And I'm up on these stairs. And I see that over one of the structures is a whole pile of ashes. <laughs> and I went, how the hell did they get up here? First of all. Second of all, that is a lot of ashes. Third, I did this. <laughs> and I was like, did you tell Rich, the owner? Did you clean it up? He went, girl, I do. I do not want to mess with the dead. They don't mess with me. I don't mess with them. And I am too smart of a faggot to know that you should not mess with that stuff. May they rest in peace. Thank you, guys. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you got a copy out. That's Thank perfect. you. Yeah. That's yeah. a funny yeah. thing I've ever heard. Thank you. Yeah. 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 What's the matter? Tell us to have a Crowley. George Phillips, who's on? He's messing with the dead now. Yeah. Alexander, Jerry Garcia. My car is frack frantically parking. We may, we may have a feature. Well, it's just not frack fracking uh, or fracking. Are you in a feature now? No, no, no. I heard that. I heard the rumor this just that coming, the so creature right. is, fan, is is the feature is uh, the, creature the, the creature that is the feature. The creature that is the feature. Remember creature features when you were a kid? Yeah. Well, well, I'm from the Beast Coast. We had a thing called creature features. I remember that. How long you played for the 49ers? No, I don't. B A Ford. Uh, uh, I was going to say Al Gore, but his first name is not Al. Frank his last name is Gore. Frank. 21. Frank Gore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. I'll pay you later. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to start my now start my time now. Okay, yeah, start right now. See how I am. S O W. So Nixon was Nixon in '61. Maybe we would have had more fun if Phoebe Rebozo in his uh, <laughs> slice of putrefied paradise, or was it pair of dice, had been in, in instead of the all too human Camelot crew. S O W. Don't trip over your ego, amigo and ignore your and my ignorance as long as you can. Till the Manhattan chase, where your hard-earned face is hidden, begins to do the poor and working poor's bidding. Hasn't everybody had the coulda, shoulda, woulda blues once in a while? Retroreactive regrets, the GOP never forgets. I vote for the person, not the party. Who's afraid of Ralph Nader? The corporations yeah. and all the outsized and our outsourced nations. Big Pharma, Quig Karma. It's a great, late, sprawling, big and baby balling world. We will share or be nowhere. So go with the flow, but not over the falls. Great. Thank you. That's the good fact. That's because I came upstairs and I'll tell you later because I don't want to take up my time talking about me. What? <laughs> what did you say? Anything. Why did I say it? That's the question. This is a, a woman that was here, Daphne Godley. Oh, my God. Yeah. Back that's a great book. book. And she was so sweet to give me. I told her I have any money. She said, just handed it to me and said nothing. Just smiled her wonderful smile. So this is straight no chaser. So you fuck girls. So what? So do I. Hey, if I was a girl, I'd be all over you. I'd be all over you now if you'd let me. You can't be a dyke. You're killing me here. I don't want to fuck men either, see? We've got a lot in common. So do you do that all the time or what? I mean, how gay are you? You know, it's okay with me that you're a lesbian. I think it's hot. I just don't like the ones who try to be men. Hey, your girlfriend looks like a boy, so how come you don't like me? What do you girls do in bed anyway? Just rub up against each other? I did that in high school. <laughs> Can I watch? I wouldn't even touch you until you wanted me to. 
If you haven't been with any men, you don't know what you're missing. Okay, maybe you've just been with the wrong 150 men. I mean, you haven't been with me yet. Do you guys, do guys just gross you out? How come you hate men? How come you don't look like a man? Can you fix cars? I bet you don't eat meat. I bet you're not really a lesbian. I bet you're just saying that so I'll go away. I know you girls do that. And that's not natural. God made Adam and Eve, not Alice and Eve. Okay, you're right. God must have made Alice too. But he didn't mean for them to fool around on Adam. <laughs> and see. My girlfriend wouldn't mind. I mean, she talks about wanting to sometimes. You want to come home and meet her? You know, my neighbor's a lesbian, my cousin's a lesbian, my sister's a lesbian, my mother's a lesbian, my ex is a lesbian, but it's not my fault. I'm a lesbian in a man's body. No, really. I just love women, and I'm trying to get all of them one at a time, and right now I'm getting into you. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from uh, Garrett Murphy, uh, who I met down, anyway, here we go. Ahmadinejad shows up Georgia. A court whom some have said consists of kangaroos gives two hikers an overly extreme sentence for a minor offense. In the meantime, Georgia, a court, in the meantime in Georgia, a court some would claim is more reverent, tries the best, tries its best to carry out a sentence lickety split, even if perchance the person is innocent, while a supposedly even more respected <coughs> court ducks the issue. Must be done, must be done. And it finally is done on the same day the supposedly kangaroo court decides the two actors can't, after all, go free. The renowned courts in Georgia and the so-called high courts would even give a Troy a chance to prove himself. Georgia is truly out of its mind, like they would claim of Ahmadinejad. Well, at least with two judges of, of the supposed kangaroos was willing to show some semblance of humanity as the two hikers and the survivors of Troy Davis, which way dear justice has truly swung. Ask, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ask the two hikers and the survivors of Troy Davis, which way this dear justice has truly swung. swung. I should do that one over because I fucked it up so bad. Uh -huh. That's I think Is it cool? Is it cool? If I do it over real quick. Okay. I'm gonna do Don Brennan's uh, poem instead because I bought all books. I'll, I'll do that one better next time, Gary. Maybe, but I'll try. I enter him. Justice is just this, the necessary and perhaps even sufficient condition for peace. Antonym, injustice, progenitor of war, creator of huge profits, the masses dreadful cotton field. So shop, drive your big ass SUV, call it freedom, punch up to 90 on an open stretch. If you can't find one, get you a white limo to cruise some private island on American Idol. Wet dream. While starvation wars rage in Darfur, Baghdad, Osaka, and San Francisco. Do blow jobs for money, love war, adore profits, enslave your mind to greed. Get on down to Bloomingdale's, motherfucker, and remember this. Don't bother yourself about justice. Thank you, Vlad. Yeah, that brings you to me and then Garrett and then our teacher should the person arrive and if not then we will figure things out at that point in time. Mark, I believe these are uh oh, thank you, sir. Anytime I can use my delirium I thank you. So we bring this back here again. Thank you. So I'm not gonna read my own stuff tonight because I came across these two books, one right after the other, and I like a lot of the things in them, so I believe. I like that. Um, <laughs> Tinker <laughs> Green is called Funeral Sentences. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just read the, I read this and this and I started reading this and I got to the other one, so I'll do a few things here like that. Bones and feathers are of the same substance, but to opposite effect. Light and heavy, up and down, Fingernail is a kind of bone, as is beak or tooth. Hair could be regarded as a species of feather. 
A coffin is a box. In the iconography of state, saints, a palm frond signifies a blessed state. Saint Apollonia carries what looks like a giant feather in one hand, tongs with an extracted tooth in the other. In the monumental and ponderous stone texts of ancient Egypt, Anubis weighs the heart of the departed against the feather of truth. This is called the Shea uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts, 1952. Apparently the Shea is a theater, so. From the outside, the movie theater is a huge, rectangular solid rising into the sunshine. A Coke machine faces the alley out back. Put a coin in the Coke machine and a heavy black bottle bumps out. Inside it's damp and the cool, inside it's damp and cool, and school's far off. Last night's disturbing dreams about something that will happen next month. Spools of time rattle past the perspective gates. The screen is a wildfire, raging flame. The restless audience is drifting smoke. To the left and to the right of the screen are blindfolded cherubs. And I'll, this is the last one, I'll read a couple of the other ones. California Nights, muggy haze, traffic stop and go, loud sirens, out of the gelato shop bumps a young man into a robot costume, practicing his robot moves all by himself along the dark sidewalk. Can I borrow your glasses? One fifty? Yeah, that'll do. Two dollars, three dollars. You might have to bend and put those down your yeah. massive glasses. Oh <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> there we go, this is perfect. <laughs> I knew something was wrong the day I tried to pick up a small piece of sunlight, and it slithered through my fingers, not wanting to take shape. Everything else stayed the same, the chairs and the carpet, all the corners where the room waited continually. It's not so much that I miss you. It's not so much that I missed you as the remembering, which I suppose is a form of missing except more positive, like the time of the blackout when fear was my first response, followed by love of the dark. <laughs> oh. I allow myself. I allow myself the luxury of breakfast. I am no nun, for Christ's sake. Charmed as I am by the sputter of bacon and the eye-opening properties of eggs, it's the coffee that's the real sacrament. In those days, I spread fires and floods of pestilence on my toast. Nowadays, <laughs> I'm more selective. I only read my horoscope by the quiet, low glow of the marmalade. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry right. I was laughing, but you had to. Uh, I understand. Glass stuck. Glass is stuck right in your uh, stem in your earlobe. And I got it on uh, photo. Thank you so much. All right. Let's uh, <laughs> with a nice round of applause, please. Come on up, Derek. Yes, sir. Oh man. Oof. I thought it was the poem that was. I, well, it was funny too, but I also caught a glimpse of myself in the uh, mirror. That really got me. All right. <laughs> That's a, I'll reflect upon it. <laughs> Tyranny of the family oriented. The gurgles should have done it. The exuberance should have done it. The cutesy smile should have done it. But for some, somehow it didn't. They said a great beauty of the new life is Stunning. They said that great bouncing is true. They say it all should make one all go in their life, but some folks just can't feel that way. 
Yet it ain't necessarily hatred or dislike, yet it ain't necessarily envy. It ain't often some perverse desire or always born out of unhappy childhoods. It's perhaps a white picket fence, or is it an obligatory dog? Maybe, or maybe not. Or well, anyway, as in any other case, perhaps it's just not all teacups. Yet this is one tyranny with which most folks seem perfectly pleased. Love and war mix all too well. For the duration of this long time courtship come war, which has been so muddled from instant one, he has never quite understood the nature of the thing. Nor he suspects does she have any more of the grasp than he, at least not the grasp of understanding. For the physical grasp, truth be told, is all too real. This has not so much been a thin line between love and hate, but rather a line so tangled and knotted up over time that any hope of determining which one is on what side was lost far longer ago than one would care to surmise. The hate is mixed with love, and the love is mixed with hate, and the whole messy batch would be gumbled, look like a bunch of separatists. It is no longer possible to tell a stroke from a slap, a kick from a kiss, or a hug from a hint. At times she longs to love, and at others she tries to rape, yet at times he tries to rape, and at others longs to love. The frustration is a potent as her own perspiration, for he genuinely loves her at times, and she genuinely loves him at times. Neither will give in, yet neither wants the other two. They are lovers yet enemies, and enemies yet lovers. Who knows when this fracas yet a romp will end, assuming that it ever will, for they are at war and at peace with each other. The spectators watching all, for they know that the outcome may well determine the ultimate fate. But in the meantime, the struggle continues between a black man and America. Yeah. Chapter 8, Yang But Yin, The Legend of Miss Dragon Eel. Now look, the doctor said with Botch's paternity, you are obviously an intelligent, perhaps even brilliant woman, and can write your own ticket despite this deception of yours. Indeed, you maintain one for many years. No dumb Billy would have pulled that off. He smiled at his own words, but, but you just can't seem to get it through your head that this medication is good for you, Florence Drone, and he sat he with him. Good for stupor and drool, she remarked in resigned defiance, laid up on her back in exaggerated agony on a psychiatrist's couch. I swear, Miss Orville, you seem to want me to discontinue this relationship. You remember, do you not, that I am one of the pathetically few to remain with you despite everything when your game was exposed? Congratulations, my dear doctor, she mocked Dean. Just your luck, Orville, and at least most of the others at Blanchstone of the city were open about it. No doubt about their honesty. And you've always passing up the opportunity to relax here as well, the doctor continued. You're not so young a lass anymore, Miss Orville, and those flawed jeans of yours can use a rest. I had a good night's sleep, she replied dryly, and that flawed jeans remarks ain't nothing worth no small replies. Watch it, one. You don't know about that, the doctor replied. She gave one loud goop all that, but knew better than to speak for her lingo when it slipped out as it had the previous night. It was during a time of such urges that she wondered if she was becoming a split or multiple personality. But she was not about to give this still pimply company man the satisfaction of inquiring about that possibility. Look, she finally said, sitting up. You mustn't think I'm not at all grateful for your philanthropy. For your philanthropy, though goodness knows I'm not, you cub scout. But surely you must have other patients in need of your hard earned and most prodigious expertise. What say you give me your prescription and let me go armed with your compassion so you can stay in good with the others? Why, how considerate are you, Miss Orville, the doctor being as if he had thought of the idea? And in a patient of your need, he reached into a desk drawer and pulled out a small sheet of paper and handed it to Florence, who rose to her feet in perfect timing to his gesture. I took the precaution of having your prescription tied up in advance. Oh, thank you, doctor, she murmured. Good luck with the other patients. Good day, Miss Orville, he said as Florence closed the door behind her. Walking through the hall on the way to the elevators, Florence looked over the prescription and muttered the contents rapidly under her breath. When she was at the elevator, she pressed the down button, then backed herself a few feet to become parallel with a receptacle with a pedal operated lid. She waited, then the down light button turned off. Florence's foot pressed the receptionist's pedal, receptacle's pedal, her hand crumpled the prescription paper, the bell signaled the elevator's arrival, and opened up, dropping the paper's remains into the receptacle. Her foot released the receptacle's pedal, closing its lid shut, and she stalked casually towards and into the open elevator. What book is that from, Gary? It says is that you, that your newest one? Uh, not quite. It's a. Uh, well, say the name of it, please. Yang Bun Yin, the Legend of Dragon. Okay. And you did the artwork on it too, didn't you? Yeah. On this, as always. All right. Thank you so much, Gary. So um, we're going to take a like.
four minute break to reset. We have a, a an emergency pair of features who's gonna who are gonna take this stand for for the time that the feature would be and that the freezer shows, then we will make further arrangements as oh, well, things may allow themselves to arrange. So have it take take a few minutes here, five minutes we'll come back and in five minutes we'll have a new surprising shoe. A really big shoe. My time is up. So I figured, like, I mean, you did 10 and he did 10. Okay, don't do this. Like, I don't think he is. I just was happy to be Well, I brought some product and stuff to divide up. Okay, so we'll do that after. All right. Talk about French. Do you think that would be a very long one? Oh, The real feature? Yeah. Marissa, just one of those? Oh, right there. Oh, okay. So we got to get you. You don't have a part of that there. Not really. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Here we're both drinking. We're not supposed to. Look at this. No shit. Listen, man. Don't tell me. Don't tell nobody. <laughs> don't tell me. Don't tell her what. Don't tell her what. Nobody tell Darren they saw me drink a beer. <laughs> We'll be back in about five minutes. The feature for the evening has arrived, and there's a little bit of schmoozing going on. So schmooze and uh, don't lose. You also read. Yeah. 
down like animals going on. I don't believe in the Antichrist because I think the real Antichrist is the hero in the the mark of the I think it's not only the Catholic Church, but this Pope, because everybody loves him. And the main thing is, yeah, it, 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 it's got to be somebody that's a totally the legend about the last Well, he was in, he was in, in the yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that was an oracle of Yeah, and, 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 and the German Pope was in the He was in the He was in the He was also in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Bill Morris, you can see the living See the movie religion. He, he goes up in front of the Vatican and he says, Now, does this look like yeah. anything Jesus would have in mind? the original Christianity the sign was the message. It wasn't this, it wasn't the cross. The cross was to mix it with Odin, where Odin was hanging on the tree. And it also it's the way the Catholic Church is at ten. Yeah, yeah. Wow, how many is in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Collection. Yeah. I know. There's no reference in the Bible. I know. 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 I I'm looking around at the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I I I I I I I I I I Hindu doesn't worship this. The picture. That's that's not this. No, no. It's just a representation. Yeah, yeah. The same thing with the witchcraft. So what's the story? Uh, basically, I worship on the nature. If we don't do something fast, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just giving you an easy time. How much time do I have? Yeah. He goes a little less with Bad boys. To the bad boys. Chicken wine. Yeah. Or you know. May the uh, <laughs> may the man may the tough mothers uh, in your in your past uh, lighten up. <laughs> so it says you're a tough mother. No. He said when you're bad, you're good. You tough mother. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got? Oh, in here? Yeah. Oh, you're, oh, you're harmonica. Uh, I'm sorry. 
While while the interlude is interluding, I could be playing harmonica for as long as you like. You could come back. Yeah, all right, I'll do that. Twist my arm up. And now for a slight music interlude, I'm going to go back to this one more feature. I won't play any Christmas carols or Thanksgiving. Uh, I'll play a funeral, a funeral for, you know, one of the funniest things they said, I, I think John Kennedy ever said was uh, that uh, we're about to uh, declare war on Turkey. It was Thanksgiving Eve, and everybody got scared to listen. He, he broke up, and then they finally started. Uh, so I'd lighten up a little bit of the seasonal uh, sadness. <laughs> Say, but you know, she said if you say those other things, I'm going out there and just you know, get your face back. I have two things to say about this wonderful poem. She's good, and she has 20 minutes for you. Give her a nice round. Bring her on up here. We're going to talk to ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out on a Wednesday evening before Thanksgiving. Uh, on a beautiful night. Uh, I just drove in from Riverside, so I appreciate everyone uh, being here. First of all, like there's a lot of places you can be Sunday. Um, it's wonderful to have everybody here. I'm sorry, I missed the reading. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so we're going to do more readings. That's good. Yeah. We'll do more. Okay, good, 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 good. Yay. Um, so, I'm at Riverside right now, um, and I guess a lot of the poems are going, I'm going to be reading are about place and, and trying to settle in um, both kind of globally in other ways that I've tried to settle in um, as well as there. This one doesn't have a title yet, uh, so I suppose, I don't want to say, well, no, it doesn't have a title, but the opening part. Um, is part of a cockwell song. Eu aqui não sou querido para nada, mas na minha terra eu sou para nada. Where are you from? Sometimes it's where they think they wish they were. No, I am not one of those lovely Indian women. I'm not from Barbados or Cape Verde. I'm not getting off the plane here. I am also not from Cape Town, although the ocean there makes me think of home. My great-great-grandfather might have been from Cuba after his great-great-grandfather came east from West Africa, where I have never been. Where are you from? In Brazil, I am from Brazil until I open my mouth. <laughs> then I'm from Argentina until I explain myself and then, yes, everyone knows or should have known from the hip swear or lack of it that I'm American. But I could be Brazilian, some Brazilians say. <laughs> they forgive what is not from there. 
Am I from the East? I sound like I'm from Philadelphia in Oakland. In Philadelphia, I am a Cali girl. And in San Francisco, I am from where my parents have lived all my life. In Avenal on I-5, where I just came from, that's not even home, it's not where I just came from, the father of the woman in the sandwich shop is from Missouri, which is, in California is east for her. I am not from Missouri, although now I am from the calmness that reminds her of her father. Sometimes where I am from or where I am not from leaves me stranded with all of my belongings, like a bus whose route changes after a certain hour. The driver says simply, I cannot take you there. Sometimes I pretend I am not from my own shadow skating over a cement lot where I am walking, where no trees grow. I am from what I carry with me, and oh beloved, sometimes you are from there too. And sometimes where I am not from shines, shells dangling from a circle, turning on its own chord, notes singing their song in the wind. Yeah. So I guess in terms of from, um, is, and I'm going to people familiar with Jack Spicer. Jack Spicer. Jack Spicer was a San Francisco poet. He's very. He was actually a very talented, very beautiful um, writer. Um, he also had a lot of hangups in some ways or whatever. So the, he wrote this one poem. Um, called Indefiniteness is the Element of True Music. We had to read this in class. And he's going on and on about true music is a seagull shrieking in the middle of nowhere to no one. And, and he's really, really upset by this. You know, like he's, he's trying to figure it out. And I was like, Jack, come on. Oh, slow down. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so, yeah, so, so, I, so I wrote back to him. So this is called uh, Visiting San Francisco with Jack Spicer. Actually, I don't think the seagull was crazy. Have you ever tried it? Breathe seagull thoughts in through your nose, gears and eyeballs, flatten them in your amygdala, push them out over your ganglia until the beginning of the weird swirls, your plasma's own water music, indefinite as hair turning gray. Mine started in my 20s. After all, before the French horn, there was the gourd. We ate music for dinner. From the hollowed out canyons, changeable as the weather, or your own two thumbs fluted over your palms, cupped together, I can never get that to work, or infinite shells stretching to infinity or at least to those cratered asteroids and your own skull. <clears throat> Did you know there's a mouse in Australia that sings? <laughs> he sits in the leaf litter and vibrates, <laughs> frequency so high we sleepwalk through his tiny bones and the wine glasses stay in place. But don't forget that's a myth. It's not the sound that shatters but the synchronicity for all we know, little Apollo, this mouse he named that was running through his house. For all we know, little Apollo could have been scatting across the chessboard, munching and calling to his buddies, hey, come and get some of this here bar food. <laughs> so I don't know why he liked your chess pieces better than french fries. Maybe they were made of maple, tasty. Maybe your house is really clean. I need to introduce you to some of my guys. <laughs> they come to all of my poetry. Um, let's see. So I like writing about jazz a lot um, and music, if you can tell. So I'll read this one. Um, it's called uh, I Remember Miles. <clears throat> I Remember Miles. Oh, I'm losing my voice. I should drink my tea. I remember Miles on stacks of $2 vinyl, eight tracks tick, tick, ticking inside the hallway closet while that hum and mute keeps singing, so what, so what? I'm the bebop brilliance empirical prince of darkness. So what? You can't mock this temple trick turned out. Leave you reeling between God and the devil, the sky and the ceiling. And daddy looks into my flute player's eyes, already hypnotized by the pendulum swing, arcing like a baton, tracing the aching space between sound and silence, like his question, you're going to learn to play like that, right? And I don't want to fail. Even though in fourth grade I know jazz musicians are male, like scientists and presidents, 
play the sax or the bass, but I, I can't disappoint that look on Dad's face. So I smile and promise maybe someday put my flute to my lips again in that way that widens the music teacher's eyes, wonder if the sounds natural and blow. And I remember mine. Middle school miles was a river I knew running through me, through hallways, deadlines, dance floors, because hip hop misogyny became too much for me. Too old to deal with young bloods, too young to see the irony. My solace was all blues with two fingers on the piano. Daddy trying to get me to play tunes I heard on the radio, dive through that vertical vertigo. Neither one of us can explain, but I'm still scared to put one note in front of the other without prop or practice or paper. The only 12 year old who loves her father's music more, or maybe who knows, Music without words is safer. Or maybe not, because high school, I'm still swinging solo, all dressed up for orchestra, no jazz to go to, until Miles ran with me away from home. I learned how to improvise with two X chromosomes, and Catherine showed me the secret blue scale inside. The black piano keys revealed that jazz must be better than sex, because she made me lay down on the floor, play Miles over us in decibels. We were starfish resisting the sea. Don't care what no lover says, I lost my virginity somewhere in the landscape where blues and green cradled me in the arms of those 12 bars, because all I could say was, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some things you don't tell your father. <laughs> <laughs> Round midnight miles was a family affair, weeknights reflected in the kitchen window pane, daddy talking tutu and sketches of Spain. How Miles' train of thought ran through mountains across continents. We'd make Miles smile when my mom was frowning because we know she can't follow the notes. Though all she says is, why aren't we doing the dishes fast enough? <laughs> and Daddy and I drove for hours and miles to where jazz floated like an island in the middle of a dry August. Didn't think I'd remember September because Miles was strutting gold with a purple and purple and gold trumpet bell in his, in his belly, channeling jelly roll, Morton fire, bird, wind, wine, shoulders hunched, crouched low, hiding wings, wounded like some seraph, God understands, knows the earth is so good. And I thought my prince had come. Even after the fall, Miles made me reminisce my own music, jump up, bebop my stories in front of newfound friends and fans until Tasha changed the key, said she don't care about none of that because Miles beat his wife. Mm -hmm. Same way Christian Slater beat his wife. Same way Sean Connery said it's okay to slap your wife in the face. Mm -hmm. Same way my father saw my grandfather hit my grandmother. Wait, stop the music. How did you riff on an out of tune memory? I listen, 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 but still can't tell if I can hear the beat. Miles left, my father standing wrapped and miles, me beside him, his oldest music child, who can't tread that half rest, a dying twice to whisper, but I know if I want to play like that, it's never as good as the first time. Miles left, me with nothing but an eight track, Cranging my neck around the curtain. I thought he'd come back, but they say some collapse in his lungs, some fracture in his mind blew the sound out too quick. I thought it was some tricks to nod. Yeah. Ain't no miles away from here. Ain't no dying, cause miles, he's been reloading on my brain. Still got some explaining to do. Like, how come he's so blind and still see that kind of blue? Nah, he lying. Cause I seen some indigo move the sun. I saw him flying. Hold up. Miles, I would take you where drums talk, where their names remember the beauty they are made of, <coughs> where all the instruments are friends of one another and keep up prayer, and the word for the rhythm of the heart and love syncopated, waves crashing or running across sand has nothing to do with fear. I will take you there. Turn our cell phone sounds off. Yeah, because yeah, I might mentioned that. Very distracting. Mine might go off in a second. Yeah, yeah. It's the price we pay for being a joint person. <laughs> <laughs>
1529, off South America's Pacific coast, when Ecuador was not your country's name. The conquistadors found out the hard way translators make lousy slaves. The Ladino, the Angolan, itching in unwashed court pantaloons, pacing between the tangled rigging of his captors' watchful lives and the veracity of Holocaust, his brethren dying in the holds below. The Ladino knew real gods did not fear red mortality flowing beneath their skin. He knew words like starboard and port were just some fancy rights and lefts. And he also knew where the knives were kept. So when he and the 20 or 30 Negroes lodged musket balls and blades deeper than prisoners inside the crew's rib cages, leaped from the foundered ship and swam until the shore gathered under their feet, they must have felt like an underdog team worth betting on. The Indios who saw them must have thought so too, approached them just as the Ladino remembered his own words for the feel of sand, the tiny crabs that scuttled at his feet. This is how each took the other in and ate and married, debated music and agriculture and whether zivas really weren't as useful as llamas. They named their children all kinds of Kikango Quechua combinations and they outlawed the language of conquerors. News traveled to the other Indios and the colonists who wondered at their strength. And Luz Serena, they, also, they wondered even harder when their New World children, whose faces looked like yours, won victory after victory, made the Spanish sue for compromise, those sambos of Esmeraldas, Indian and black. In the US, Sambo, wields its A like a flat hand, cracks its S like a whip in your parents' living room. Crouched on the carpet floor, your mother and I search for lost etymologies, a ring of keys we saw hanging from the overseer's belt. We scour Quito and Bahia, but find only relics of drums singing, samba polished feet, and a statue in Esmeraldas with eyes towards the sky. The Ladino, I think, the Ladino would know. And turn in time to see you dancing. You squeeze and spring from your father's knees, six months small circled in his hands, swinging your feet free. The Sambos of Esmeraldas did not know then the Spanish Empire would still devour them, slow roasted instead of raw. History founded us on a different shore, words caught like seeds in our clothing. We know what the Sambos know, and also wish the Ladino left us the words to explain when to present fists or flowers, or simply wait for a sign of grace. 
But when your newborn brother clutches your fingers to ask you the same earnest question, you will answer his milk gray eyes with serene light from your own, coax his hands open to take your hand or a weapon, and you will flourish against your enemies, the names you make your own. Gracious, what was he? He was like a paraprofessional male role model coach person named Zachary Rollins um, at my middle school, um, and he still managed to. He still lives in San Francisco, you know. After you know, not age myself, but since 1987 to 1990, when I was in middle school, um, and I run into him every once in a while. And so I ran into him on the bus, um, and I told him at the time I was living now in Petrel Hill. I managed to live in kind of like this little. Uh, in-law apartment of my high school friend's mother. So, so this is kind of like old school San Francisco circling the white ends here. Like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna try to hang in there. But clearly, um, you know, there's a lot to that. And so, uh, but I told him I was living in Betrayal Hill, and he like stops as if you know this has been on his mind for like the past 20 years. And he says, I don't know why you all were always afraid of the kids from Betrayal Hill. They were the nicest kids. I went to Horace Mann Middle School. And there was this rivalry. So this is called geography lesson. First lesson took place middle school in the mission as a 24th and always 10 degrees warmer. El Farol, chi, a Chinese food and donuts, the BART station, McDonald's, four corners of a compass. Learned you could find around the corner a mom and pop shop of homemade popsicles, rainbow of raw fruit and sugar frozen to a stick. We go there, complete the spectrum. Vietnamese sweet coffee, toffee Latinos and Latinas, Cara black and honey mixed kids, always synchronizing sweatshirt socks, neon shoelaces, high tops, t-shirts spotless for school and after. We go to our separate ways, striding to the rhythm of the bus route names. 14 Mission, 26 Valencia, the 49, the 67, proud of the maps in our minds. I don't know why. We thought Petrel Hill kids were different, bigger, meaner. Goliaths from another country on the other side of town. Rumors swirled of fights, shootings, bigger, meaner than the ones in the mission. Never wondered if they liked homemade popsicles, or why we were even more afraid of Oakland, or why the kids in the suburbs were afraid of all of us. <laughs> you all were always afraid. We strap on our softball gear, pretend we weren't terrified of traveling there. Their fields smelled like beer from the brewery nearby. The girls seemed to scowl more, the coaches smile less. All of us trapped in steel and concrete shadows of the factories. How weak we'd be if we lost, how angry they'd be if we won, or was it just our imaginations? Years later, a cabbie takes me home, tears around the corner of Mariposa and Connecticut, his mind a 47-year-old map of the seven by seven, factories converted to lofts, condos in steel and concrete gleaming next to Porsches and BMWs, remarking how the neighborhood sure has come up. You know, O.J. Simpson was from Petrero Hill. <laughs> yes, I say, and Danny Glover, without missing a beat, he talks of Danny's deadbeat brother, of the kids from Petrero Hill who sometimes run for the 48 I catch to work at home, help their moms with a suitcase full of laundry, smile more at babies in strollers uh, than at sunlight blistering the worn paint of the projects. Same as apartheid, mining towns, or favelas, or Palestinian shanty towns, or more or less, no, really, the same. Eyes and desire to win a softball game, to eat cool popsicles where it's always 10 degrees warmer, not to have to talk about them shut the night before, not to have to listen to them at all. Petrero, Petrero, Petrero Hill, they were the nicest kids. A Petrero brands young horses before they know they are free. Who steered this map to my mind's geography? Who decided the teams? Who set up the game? And who blessed us, gave us a hint that day with the the last inning, the final pitch, 
the game ending in a tie and the cool fog rolling in. I want to take a walk tonight, alone because I like the feel of the rain, warm on nights like this, how the moisture is almost enough to buoy your body through the air, barometric pressure shifting through the atmosphere, creating heat or hurricanes. I want to take a walk tonight by myself in this neighborhood where my father lives, by myself because I figured out the cul-de-sac, the shortcut to the corner store not too far away, just a quick walk past the house of the lady who wants me to wash her car maybe sometime next week, by myself so I can have a moment to talk on the phone without Chad listening in, because he don't need to know everything about me, well not yet, but we're cool and it might even be cool to be stepbrothers because then maybe I can be a role model for him the way my brother is to me because that's what it comes down to, right? Family. But I can't. Because even when I don't think about being the accumulation of clutched purses followed in convenience stores or trailed in the mall, someone still might see me wrong, the wrong age, wrong color, wrong clothes, wrong hour, wrong neighborhood, wrong side of the street, someone else's inconvenience or potential robbery, have to think about being cool with the cops even though I don't want them to think they're over me, and having a black president don't mean shit when I sit by myself on the bus and every seat taken, but most people would rather stand than six next to me, and I wanna shout, hey, I did pretty good on my PSATs, and when I grow up, I'm gonna be an astronaut. Watch me somersault over the stars. Over the stars. That don't matter, because I have friends who understand me, and my mother tells me, and my father tells me, and my uncle tells me during our talks on the days when the nurse doesn't come to just do me, stay focused, take my honors classes, do well in math, and please, please, please quit talking back to in Mr. Winchell's class. Even if he's teaching history all wrong, let us handle it. I want to take a walk tonight here where my father lives, by myself or maybe just with my friend on the phone, because sometimes she helps quiet the storms in my mind eases the barometric pressure, tells me family changes aren't that bad, I can handle it, and I'll be in college two, in two years, and things will be real good then. I want to take a walk tonight. Sometimes I feel like flying on a night like this. I'm gonna be someone's new brother, and I'm already yours. But who will be my keeper? Who will call me America's son? Yeah. I have poems that make me happy when I write sad poems. <laughs> so, 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 um, so I'll finish this one with those. Why are you and I awake tonight? 2 a.m. listening to radio serendipity. Don't hardly recognize at first your sweet DJ baritone dipping honey even from stones. 
rapacious skyscrapers, the late night news of homes bombed back to a state of quarry. Why can I still hear your voice and mingus too much blessings from my hand strapped in static pose of my computer keys? When I believe I work alone, when you believe no one is listening, and why, when I call the station to answer serendipity, why does our laughter bloom, orchids staggering through concrete? Why does Mingus make their petals whisper lonely nights in Selma, Alabama, refract into nights after siege in Fallujah, in Sudan, in Bhopal, not letting me go except for us blues people, echoing no lonely nights everywhere? Because I was looking for my freedom and found you. Not some silly fairy tale, Horace Walpole got wrong anyway about these three princes of serendip, the origin of serendipity. Wrong because he left out the part about the hand that rises from the ocean to devour the world. And I already know happy endings don't come easy or sometimes <coughs> at all, and I don't believe in princes. Was just looking for my freedom and found you. Not some magazine cover banshee headline screaming, lose weight, make money with 100 ways to give him what he really wants in bed, next to Kim and Chloe and Kim and Kanye again. Or Brangelina blaring from every single checkout aisle. Not some Hallmark card, arthritic frozen smile. Not even some scary red construction paper valentine, the kind you didn't want or didn't get in fourth grade still chasing you back to childhood. I don't believe in valentines, because I'm talking daily, make your own serendipity. I'm talking about love that flows even from broken stones. Love, bro love broadcast loud enough so instead of getting mad, I do something. Love that winds orchids around faces I cannot see, winds around this hour, lifts me up, keeps me looking for freedom. Love that defeats the hand devouring the world, subdues it by disagreeing. Love that folds up its own fingers to say we don't need five or four or three people with a common purpose to win victory, only two. So what if I barely know you? I need you in my crew. You listening at 2 a.m. And love becomes serene, deliberate ties between you and me. You spinning serendipity, all the providence I need. Because then, then I can believe in you and I awake tonight that a better world is possible.
is dandy, but liquor is quick. <laughs> That's it. Ta da! <laughs> All right. Oh, I thought it was candy is dandy, but sex don't rot your teeth. Well, <laughs> see how you are. A variation on the thing. I got it. But now, Buford, our closing and plastic Christmas tree limb is Jay, a 15-year-old boy, autistic, with little speech, grabbed the individual pieces of green reluctantly. He was usually, he usually flings his arms about and uh, scrunches his nose, his thumbs pointed downward in, a, in seemingly self-degradation. This time, he holds the plastic greenery as I spread the bent and folded over limp, straightening as I went along. He twitched his face into various contortions, but the, but the nice smile he owns is there, hiding at times, but nonetheless forthcoming in moments. The most functional student in the class holds the centerpiece. The head teacher notices. Mr. Buford put up the Christmas tree in our class, she credits me. Eduardo did most of the work, I say. Proud to be modest and credit, of course, his hard work. I just really enjoyed the whole process. Good night. <laughs> this is called Moscone Milk. I was a young man when Dan White, the former supervisor who was too conservative to keep his seat on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and obviously too disturbed, shot and killed Harvey Milk and George Moscone, supervisor and mayor of San Francisco, respectively. I held a similar position to the one I hold now, instructional A2 in the San Francisco Unified School District. The reading lab director, a reading and English teacher, a veteran teacher close to the age I am now, I would suspect, said about the murder assassinations of the two, quote, progressives, as today's examiner termed them here on the 35th anniversary of the horrific deed, that Moscone was the, quote, most important of the two. And I was shocked. A teacher's aide colleague of mine around the same time had given me an anti-Briggs amendment uh, button to wear. Briggs was a California assemblyman who was against gay people working in the public schools. One supervisor said to me, our supervisor said to me as I wore the pen that Mr. Briggs, quote, wanted to see me, unquote, obviously harassing me about wearing the pen. And though I am straight, I found the Briggs witch hunt against gay employees of the California schools rather Nazi-esque in its nature. Those of us on the liberal side in the schools and everywhere else, I'm sure, were in shock over this issue. The day after Dan White received his life sentence for the double murder, I had moved on to work for a brief time in the, for the federal government because of Proposition 13 layoffs. And the federal building in the Civic Center was trashed as we walked into work. The reaction to the White sentence, White subsequently committed suicide. Harvey Milk was remembered, of course, in the Castro District, along with a number of buildings, with a number of buildings and various celebrations of his short life. I have worked as a substitute at the elementary school there. A mural at Harvey Milk Elementary School is charming and very kid-friendly. Milk looks almost childlike himself in the mural, his youth and exuberance preserved forever. Okay, I'll do about uh, 
the Missouri State football, just to get off that heavy note that I just did. I've got today, tomorrow, and Friday off. Tomorrow being Thanksgiving Day. Money made in the millions, I'm sure, on football, the great American and Canadian violent pastime. Twelve packs of beer will be sold by the millions. Drunk people, mostly men, I guess, will cheer for their favorite teams that boo against the 11 men on the field of battle on the other side. Uh, the pads on a Sunday afternoon and evening. Personally, I don't drink beer anymore by the gallon. Only one alcoholic, non-alcoholic beer per day, which is, uh, as my best friend puts it, a woman who has control of her drinking says, it doesn't smell like beer at all. <laughs> I, I go with her to her family's house tomorrow to one of her, uh, uh, and one of her four sisters. That's the best part of Thanksgiving. That's right, Hubert. Thanks. Okay, here's a real heavy uh, one. This is called In Capitalist America. In Capitalist America, it's the usual saga of hard work for low pay. We paraprofessionals, a term afforded to us who have everything we have to give to the differently able. In this case, high school students with first grade to fifth grade reading levels in the ninth, twelfth grades, while the head teacher rolls out statistics and individual educational plans on the computer and seldom interacts with students in any significant way. We are the near 64-year-old one-time adjunct college English professor who is now uh, changes a 16-year-old's diaper and with help puts him into a walker for 90 minutes, minutes of exercise a day. We are the 69-year-old former computer programmer who sits in classes and attempts, uh, and attempts to help the developmentally challenged 200-pound 16-year-old who busies herself about the high school campus in an attempt to be social with the regular student populace in an attempt to be socially recognized. We are the one-eyed, cancer-stricken paraprofessional, 52 years old, who goes to art classes with students in a painful attempt to better illustrate their futures. We are the hyperkinetic, 50-something talent, uh, talented photographer who sits with students to help them organize their thoughts about subjects like English and social studies, taking a few too many pounds up three flights of stairs in the name of trying to stand out student illiteracy. We are all of the above joined by the third new teacher in not quite two and a half years who is like a boxer more, uh, more often backed up against the ropes than learning anything significant from the experience. We are all there trying to learn more than we teach. The students there in a jungle with little direction. The lines of degradation constantly closing in. The school and district administrations spinning out our pa their paper excuses about why and where the kids fail. You for your on You forgot them. You forgot the teachers. Danny, we got time for one more. Yeah. Come on, it's thanks to Yeah, listen to this. All right. This, 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 this is good. My wife told me not to read it. <laughs> he's, li he's living large and on camera. All right. This is called The Rocking Chair. Homely in a homely home. His name was Jerry Quisnell. He was homely and oily and my best friend's first lover. And he fucking died. He was not ordinary or perfect. And I was an imperfect mutant butterfly in the 1970s with pink pants and wings sprouting out of my shoulders. <laughs> And my angry green father, Greek father, <laughs> was not into Greek when my friend jammed at home 
deep into Jerry's ass and it hurt like heaven. Heaven and family sin, oh broken heart, I lost my father who knew I was queer too with a thousand years of guilt. When if it had a, when if it had a pulse back then, you fucked it. Boys burned, screaming shit, tasting ejaculation elixir, rebellion of a young man's soul, dying, his soul betraying art, as the gods weep and a boy fails his folks that I could have been. He was a saint, but now daddy says a sinner, thinner, and me in my pink pants and Mick Jagger imitation. It's no paradise, a family disgrace, black sheep with a black soul. And I listen to James Brown and dance across the floor, horrifying the old fart. <laughs> Jerry Quiznell, he was my brother. And I slinked into the tomb of my father's condominium. Oh, crippled father. Oh, amputated grandfather, castrated planet. When so much joy is possible, we mutate into artists. In our queerness is our paint and pens. Oh, rocking chair. Oh, Armageddon. Women split in two at our birth. We dance with our mothers when we are born. When we die, oh, God, this makes me cry. Jerry died when they called it grid. <coughs> we were all test cases victims of AIDS, a government plot, those ancient chthonic demons, priests of doom, yet we are still lovely reptiles with glorious scales, grandfather lizards burning in the rocking chair, singing songs of Walt Whitman and the poisoning of nature, and we sad children in the tunnel of our hated secret, even fathers hating himself, pipe in mouth, Slippers made of iron, rusted iron maidens of history that condemned us all for our humanity when we were children, loving everyone. Small child in rocking chair, back and forth from fire to ice. Because girl loved girl and boy loved boy. God damn this stupid history. Thin and tortured like El Greco paintings when the priests marched the faggots into the fire. His name was Jerry Quiznell, and he didn't have to die. He had pimples and acne, and afterwards, when he died, I walked to my hotel through the Broadway Tunnel birth canal into a forbidden future, father screaming at, my, at his son, mother weeping for the daughters. The whole damned world in a rocking chair, back and forth from truth to lie, the love we bear can speak its name, can scream it from the rooftops. But can the rooftops scream back? Our names, our loves, our passions, our must we be or must we be born, the rooftops burn to the ground because this is our time of freedom and the rooftops must burn and we must have courage and we can and we must and we will. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me read. Thank you. I don't think, I understand why your wife would feel that. I said don't. I gotta do something Would you kindly shuffle these and uh, return them to me in such a way that they're completely confused? I'm waiting my hand. The prize cards of the evening. The gentle angel like hands of the teacher, please. She laughs. But she doesn't see it as I see it. Thank you. Yes. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Things on. So you have Curvature Blue and Seal Line Day. Poetry Review. The Mini Feature. 
The medieval cookbook. I'm going to feed your creature. Fat eggs. What? <laughs> Dan Brady's a teacher. Audubon Society, you ought to have been there. This is a double, this is two books of poetry by a man and wife team who were here not too long ago from England. They gave me those, they're very beautiful. And of course, National, uh, I was going to say the National of America. <laughs> National Geographic Magazine, Mount St. Helens. My favorite part of that story is the people, my favorite part of that story is they knew the mountain was going to blow up. So they told the people to get off the mountain. People got off the mountain. And the people said, it's not going to blow up. And the scientists said, oh, yes, it is. And they said, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. So the people sued and won. <laughs> Two days after they moved back onto the mountain, it blew up. I mean, you know, it was a true story. I go, why do they want to go back to a mountain that's changing its shape and rumbling all the time? Probably a poetry. Anyway. Oh, and the descendants of those people who died are suing the government for not having, for, for losing the law case that they had to prevent them from going back up there. Right. It hasn't More ended liars. yet. More liars. It's like, you know, so here we go. Hey, lawyers have to make the yeah. 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 lawyers. Drum roll! Yeah. Wow! Jared okay. Murphy, you are the winner. Yes! The winner of the evening. Yes! The mini feature is available. Take it, Garrett. GM, Miss GM yourself. He's not the main teacher, is there? He acknowledges. But he's studying. He's got teachers all over town. It's too much. Oh, that, well, that's true, but that's okay. That's like I said, my husband and wife. Yeah. It has little flyers in it. Oh, take both. Gary, yeah. you're so gracious not to take both. Yes, you are. He's a gracious person. Thank you. All right, drum roll. Uh, yeah. I did that on purpose. <laughs> if I was in the ocean, I'd have done it on purpose. Yeah. Why? Chris Trian. Where is Chris? Here he is. I will take the major feature. See how Chris he is, is coming back. All right. Now, I'm going to write your name down. Yeah, you write it down. You mind if I share it with you? Is that legal? No, that's It's your that time legal? to spend the way you see fit. Okay. And if you see the fit to fit that way, seeing them sit, feed, if you say Sam Brady's a teacher. And her health is good. If, if her leg is, is okay. I am the emperor of the north. Eddie. Eddie. And we love her. Eddie is a good Remember, bad eggs. Never know when you're going to know how to cook an egg. I never knew how to uh, cook an egg. Dan Brady's a good egg. Oh, I'm done, Paul. Oh, I thought it was wrong. I thought it was still there. Long gone. Hey. Yeah. Charles. Charles himself. Charles. Hey. Charles won the grand prize. You are a winner. No, I do. Yeah, when it's down to the small crowd, everybody wins. Exactly right, there's more people than there are. Dad Brady? Oh, they knew he, he made That's the National right. Geographic. Uh, <laughs> I can have this one. Oh, he doesn't have that. Uh, and, and I know I'm surprised that they I always try to do it. Who's going to take place. what? And that's a problem. We can get a few other, like three artists. And, and we can fill this place. Oh, this is you. You have a prize. Oh, wow. One of these three fabulous prizes are yours. Yes, Chris, I do. Chris will be jumping up now, screaming. No, no, thank you so much. Don't do this at home. Everything is being recorded because Big Brother is watching you. And it's big sister too. If, 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 if there's more people doing it. I should have got Don's ready when he was yawning. Can I throw up? Can I get you a book in this gentleman next year? I so, use the term loosely. I use it every time. I already have my tricky thing on my show. Well, now I will graciously take one. 
Get them together. Yeah, there's, 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 there's this person up here, and I'm sure there's about a half a dozen other people that say. How about you? Yeah, yeah. Rainbow. There you are. Lucy Langdon just found a home. Oh, good. And oh, oh, oh. Mercer, you are a winner. Bill. Oh, okay. He has the Audubon or the Poetry of You. I believe I know what he's going to take. I believe I know. Mr. Edson himself, can I take a photo of you, sir? Can I take a photo of you, sir? Is that what you're saying? There he is. He told, what's the meaning of life? Don't be shit, don't be shit, he said. Don't be and shit. And he said it right on the camera. He did. Mark the hearts. Where the hell is that dude? Well, let me cam it up a little bit more every semester. Well, here I am, my son. Here's I play the harmonica, but you know, the union won't let me play it for less than a dollar a note. And God damn it, I'd, I'd agree with him. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. He Come gives me what I want. Come back. Hey, wait a minute, you're part of the future. There's no feature, there's no meaning, no one took it. Yes, no. Uh, I sent the man. Garrett Murray. Well, how dare you? Garrett took it. No. No, he didn't. No, I took it. He took it. Carl Vita is the picture next week. I stand corrected. Now you can see the picture. Carl Vita next week. What? Carl Vita is the picture? Yes, Carl Vita. Carl Vita is the picture next week. My hearing is on. That's all I'm going to say. That's so perfect. Same bat time, same bat station. Return. Thanks, Mr. Calabash, wherever I am. Yeah. Ah, you're lovely. Ah, you're lovely.